Hi, thanks for tuning in to the uh, latest edition uh, in the CS225 online video series. Uh, I'm Chase, and today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Huffman encoding, because uh, your lab is going to deal with uh, implementing this algorithm. Uh, it's a cool algorithm, and uh, uh, it should be a lot of fun. So let's get started. Um, so uh, first I want to give some uh, motivation for why we care about Huffman encoding in general, and then I'll talk a little bit about the implementation and step through the algorithm that you'll be implementing uh, during the lab so you have a better idea of what you're doing. Okay, so why do we care? Um, the reason why we care is uh, compression is important. Um, and uh, as we'll see later, Huffman encoding helps us compress things. Um, in particular, uh, compression is important uh, for, I mean, a number of reasons. Um, but one one reason why it's important is uh, it improves our ability to transfer things over a network. Um, in general, it may be expensive to transmit a lot of bytes over a network or a large file over a network. Uh, bandwidth may be expensive, connections slow, uh, many other things, right? So we need some way of, of reducing the amount of space something takes up so it's easier to transfer. Um, likewise, you know, there's there's this notion of reducing the number, the the actual physical space it takes up on a hard drive, right? So, um, compression has a lot of imp of of importance in this area uh, of trying to reduce file sizes, right? And compression is the way you do this. Um, and there are all kinds of different ways of compressing things, and you're probably familiar with a lot of them. Um, but there's sort of two camps of compression uh, that you should be aware of. Um, the first is what's called lossy encoding, or lossy compression. Um, lossy compression, uh, the most uh, well-known example of this is JPEG. Um, JPEG is an image format, so if you've ever looked at a .jpg on the internet, you're familiar with what a JPEG is. A JPEG is a compressed version of a bitmap, a bitmap being a .bmp image, which if you've ever looked at them, you've noticed that they're enormous, they're large, they're really, really a pain to deal with, because they are not compressed. They have, for every single pixel in the image, they're storing all of the bytes for all of the color components of that image. So every pixel probably has four bytes, one for red, one for green, one for blue, one for alpha, for every pixel in that bitmap. And that can get fairly expensive when you have a large image, right? So JPEG exists because we want to reduce the, the file size of these things. We wanted to be able to send images on the internet across the network and sending a bitmap was just not practical, right? If it's a very big file, sending megabytes when back in the days of dial-up was just ridiculous, right? So you, you wanted to, uh, to, to minimize the, the size of, of these images, and JPEG was sort of the answer. Um, JPEG uses Huffman encoding internally. Uh, it does some more advanced things than Huffman encoding, but it does use some Huffman encoding internally, and it does that to try and reduce the file. Um, the main thing to keep in mind about lossy encoding, however, is that you're not guaranteed to get the same output bit for bit when you decompress. Okay, so if you have something that's been compressed, uh, loss E, in a lossy way, uh, when you decompress it, you're not going to get the same output as you had the input, right? If you look at the thing that you compressed into JPEG, the original is going to look better than the compressed version, but the compressed version is going to be much smaller, right? So this is good for things where you may not notice the difference so much. So it's good for things like video or things like images, right? So where if it's a couple bytes off, it's not going to matter, right? You're not going to really notice, right? If there's just if there's a if there's a few bytes that have wrong bits every once in a while, it's not a big deal, right? Um, so it's great for things like that. Not so great if you are trying to zip, say, your uh, paper. Right. If you're trying to put your paper in a zip file and to send it to your instructor to grade, if your instructor extracts your paper and gets a garbled mess uh, every once in a while on some of the words, you're not going to get a good grade for it. Right. So, so uh, lossy encoding is not good for things that you need to be guaranteed the same output uh, after decompressing as you had input into the compression process, right? So you need to be able to uh, recover the thing back out of it. That camp of things is called lossless compression, or lossless encoding, right? So I just alluded to the fact that uh, zip files and gzipped tarballs 
are examples of lossless encoding, right? You put something in a zip file or a gzip tarball, you send it, someone decompresses it, you get the exact same output. Even though it was smaller, they somehow managed to retain every bit of information in, in, in that file. Uh, PNGs are also an example of losslessly encoded images, right? So PNGs actually do represent every single bit of information about the pixels in that image, which makes them great for this class. Um, but they're they're compressed, right? They're not nearly as big as a bitmap, right? If you took if you took some of the larger images from some of the labs and tried to make them into a bitmap, you would waste a lot of space because bitmaps are not compressed. PNGs are compressed, and so um, they they can reduce the amount of space that they they take up dramatically. Um, and the 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 overriding factor of these lossless encodings is that you're guaranteed to get the same output bit for bit when you decompress, right? You're going to get the exact, exact same output as you had input. And that's important for things where you need all of the bits of the file, right? You need to make sure that there are no errors in the file introduced by the compression. Um, and Huffman encoding, Huffman coding is a form of this lossless kind of compression, right? So you could take a file, compress it using Huffman encoding, decompress it later and get the exact same output. So Huffman coding uh, in general guarantees that you have a lossless representation of what you had before. Now that being said, there's lots of different variants of Huffman. Uh, Huffman is used for Huffman is used even in things that are lossy, but Huffman in general is a lossless form of compression, right? So Huffman uh, is a lossless compression algorithm and we'll use it um, in this class to compress text files. Um, so now the, the question comes, and that is why, how, why and how do these lossless compression algorithms save space? You could probably imagine why lossy compression algorithms save you space, right? They're losing some information, so, I mean, all the information they lost is, is space that you gain, right? Space that's not used to store that file. But what about the lossless encodings, right? The lossless encodings somehow manage to represent the exact same information in a smaller amount of bits, a smaller amount of bytes. Somehow they've managed to do this. And the, the question is how? Um, and uh, so the, the intuition the intuition is the following. Um, let's say, for instance, we have some file, okay, some text file uh, to, to make our lives simple. Um, one of the main observations if we want to make this thing smaller, is that there's some kind of redundant or repeated information in that file, right? So if you look at any book that anyone has ever written, right, there's no way they can avoid repeating, say, a particular word, right? A lot of the words appear many, many times, uh, so there's a lot of repeated information in this in this file, right? There's lots of repeated information in the book. If you look at uh, characters in the file, it's the same thing, right? You you it's very difficult to write an entire novel and not use the letter A more than once, right? Uh, the letter I more than once, the letter E more than once, right? So you have lots of things that are repeating. The second key observation is that this repetition is uneven, right? So the, the, what that means is that the, the frequency with which these patterns appear um, is non-uniform, right? So, so the letter A may appear way more times than, say, the letter Z. And that's sort of intuitive, right? If you have a text file, that's certainly the case for English. Um, and in general, it's the case for characters. It's also the case for words, right? There's, this, there's a thing called Zipf's Law, which, tel which tells you the frequency with which uh, you know, words appear in, in text uh, sort of drops off dramatically, right? There's a, lot, there's, some, there's a very small subset of words that appear all the time, and then there's a whole bunch of words that you never see, right? So. Um, what this is saying is that there's, it's non-uniform, so you don't know, uh, you know for a fact that the, um, each of the words in the file does not appear exactly the same num amount of time, right? There's lots of variation in the amount of times every character or every word appears in this file. So using these two assumptions, we can, uh, we, so, so we can abuse these two assumptions to compress our file, right? And the idea, the key idea is this. If we allocate a small number of bits to frequent things and a larger number of bits to infrequent things, we can actually reduce the amount of space needed to store the file. Okay? 
So if we look at, so we know, say, the letter I appears way more times than the letter Z. If, we're, if we um, stored this file in the traditional text file way, which is to say, okay, we're just going to store it as a sequence of characters, every character is a byte. Right? There's, there's no variation in the, um, the width or the amount of bits necessary to store that byte. Right? If we stored this in a traditional way, uh, all of the i's would cost, quote unquote, you know, you'd get cost in terms of bytes. Uh, all of the all of the i's in the file cost the same amount as all of the z's in the file, even though you see way more many i's than z's. The idea is if we can reduce the amount of bytes necessary to store all of the i's. So if we say, okay, an I, if we can represent an i with, uh, if in an ideal world, if we could represent i with a single bit, then we've reduced the size of this file because every time we see an i, we're going to replace it with this single bit. And, and the trade-off is if we do that for the i's, we have to make the z's somewhat larger because we need these, we need to be able to look at a code and determine exactly what character or word it represented, right? So um, the idea is that we're sort of, we're sort of reshuffling, instead of having everything be the exact same bits, bits and length, we're reshuffling the lengths around so that the frequent things are small and the infrequent things are large. And if you have this guarantee that your repetition, your distribution of these patterns is uh, non-uniform, you get a lot of compression out of it because you can you can use this 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 uh, these frequent things. You can assign small things to small codes, the frequent things, and large codes, the infrequent things, and you don't pay the cost for that large code for an infrequent thing very often, and you save a lot of space every time a frequent thing happens. That's sort of the the main idea uh, for this for this sort of uh, this algorithm. Okay. And uh, so now, now, now that we've got got this sort of intuition for why or how this is going to work, uh, let's take a look at the algorithm. Okay, the first step in the algorithm is to determine how frequently each pattern occurs in this file. Okay, so uh, if we're dealing with text, that c that pattern could be just a single character. It could be a word. If we're dealing with images, maybe it's a pattern that is you know the block of 10 pixels that are next to each other, right? We look at that and we see how frequently those occur. Uh, there are many, many, many ways you can interpret this pattern. It's just that you, you have some unit of measure that you're kind of cutting this file up into, into, okay? So the first step is we need to figure out how frequently each pattern occurs in this file, right? Because we want to do something different based on the frequency of these, of these patterns. Um, next, we're going to sort the patterns by their frequency, okay? So we're going to look and say, okay, if... Uh, if i appears way many more times than z, way more t way more than z, uh, we're going to sort these patterns so that z shows up first, and and i shows up last, right? So we sort them by frequency in increasing order. So the first thing in our list will be the least frequent. The last thing on our list will be the most frequent. Okay. Then we're going to build a tree. We're going to build this tree from the bottom up starting with the least frequent patterns and ending with the most frequent patterns. What that is saying is we're going to build the leaf nodes first. And then once we've built the leaf nodes, we're going to build the all of the internal nodes going up this tree until we hit the root and we're done. Okay? So we're building it instead of from the top down, we're building it from the bottom up, right? And the idea is since we're starting with the we're starting with the least frequent patterns and ending with the most frequent patterns, okay? And we're building from the bottom up. The depth of a node in this tree is directly proportional to the length of its binary code in the compressed version of the file. Okay, so since you are starting with the least frequent patterns, and you know that the the least frequent if the least frequent patterns are at the very bottom of the tree, you know that they have the longest, the highest depth from the root. Right, they're farthest away from the root, so they have a large depth. This, if we build a tree in this way, and we and we somehow uh, figure out what the binary code is for a particular letter based on the tree structure, we are, if we're starting with the least frequent patterns, we know that uh, the infrequent patterns are getting long codes, and if we're waiting until the very end to touch our frequent patterns, those patterns are going to be very high up in the tree, thus we'll have a very small depth and we'll have very short codes. Okay. 
So this is the mechanism by which we're going to assign codes to letters such that the frequent letters have small codes and the infrequent letters have uh, large codes. Okay, this is sort of the this is this this is the rough sketch of the algorithm. Okay, so now let's do an example. Let's just step through an example. Okay, let's say we want to compress this file. This file is sort of a simple file just just for being able to step through it. Uh, the file contains a single sentence: "Feed me more food," okay, because I'm hungry. Uh, so, the first step is to find the frequencies, right? We want to find the frequency with which each character in this sentence appears. So we do that by just counting, right? We count the number of times F shows up. We count the number of times E shows up. D space. This is a space. That's a space. Um, M R O etc. Right? So we figure out what the frequencies are. Then, if you remember, we sort these frequencies, right? So we want to sort these frequencies um, so that the least frequent pattern is at the front of our list and the most frequent pattern is at the back of our list, right? So we've sorted. This is where we start. This is where we end, okay? So we've just looked and we've just sorted this list, okay? Now, is come, now comes the interesting part where we actually build the tree, okay? We've just looked at their frequencies, we just calculated them, sorted them, now we're going to build a tree. Okay, Here's the sorted list of frequencies again. Uh, let's build this tree. Okay, The first thing we're going to do is we're going to create leaf nodes for every character in this list. Okay, So I'm just going to create some leaf nodes for this tree immediately. Um, I'm going to put them in an order so it's, it's nice to draw. Um, so uh, normally you would just put them in the order that they show up here. Um, so I'll make a node for R uh, with frequency 1, I'll make a node for F with frequency 2, I'll make a node with D with frequency 2, M with frequency 2, E with frequency 4, space with frequency 3, O with frequency 3, okay? So I've made a, a, you can verify, I've made a, a leaf node for all of the, the things in this list. Then I'm going to create two queues. These queues are going to help me keep track of, of the, the, the things that I'm, I'm uh, building this tree with. Okay. So the first queue is going to be called the single queue. And I'm going to put in things this way, and they're going to come out this way. Okay, what I put in the single queue are the all of the leaf nodes I've created, and I put them on in the order they show up in this list. Okay, so that means R would go on first, then F, then D, then M, then space, then O, and then E. Okay. I also have a second queue which is called the merge queue. Okay. This will start off empty, but we'll see how it's used in a second. Okay. The algorithm continues while there is at least two nodes in both of the queues. Okay, so if you look at both, if, if you had one node in the single queue and one node in the merge queue, you would continue because the sum of the sizes of the queues is greater than or equal to 2. Okay, so you stop when there's only one node left. Okay, um, that node that's left over will be our root. Okay, so we're, we're going to sort of go through here, we're going to build internal nodes, and then when we're down to only one internal node, we know that that's the root and we're done. Okay, um, the idea here is we're going to take off two nodes from our two queues, create one internal node, and put that one internal node onto a queue. So we're going to remove two nodes, uh, create a node, so that we're always going down by a node every step of the algorithm, so we will terminate uh, because we're running out of nodes. Right? Um, that's the intuition. Okay. So we start with a bunch of leaf nodes, uh, then we're going to uh, look at our two queues, find, we're going to find the smallest thing first. Okay, so obviously this merge queue is sort of not interesting because there's nothing on it, right? So the smallest thing must be at the front of the single queue because they're in here in sorted order. Okay, that'll be important. The fact that the fact that the fronts, 
that these cues are always in sorted order will be important. Okay, and they will naturally be in sorted order just because this one starts off in sorted order. Okay, so we're gonna look for the smallest thing. We see that it's R. We remove R from the queue. We're going to make an internal node of our tree with its left child being the smallest thing that we removed from the queue. Okay, so the left child of this new internal node is R. Okay, then we go. Then we look uh, to find. We want to initialize the right child of this node that we've just made. So we look. What's the smallest thing on the merge queue or the single queue? F because there's nothing on the merge queue, meaning that the right child of this node is F. Okay. So we've made an internal node, we've set its left child to be the smallest thing, its right child to be the second smallest thing. Then we set that node's frequency. That node's frequency will be the sum of its two children. So the frequency of this node will be 3. Okay. The character for this node, eh, we don't care. Okay, so we only care about the characters of the leaf nodes. All the internal nodes, we don't care about the characters, right? They're just there as stepping stones on the way to a leaf node, okay? So we don't care about the, we don't have any need to store the character in three. It could be whatever we wanted it to be. However, I'm going to need some name that, so that I can write here so you know what, know what I'm talking about. So I'm just going to call it RF, but that's not the character stored here, right? There's only one character stored in this node. And there's nothing in it because we don't care. Okay, so we've made this new node and then we put it on the merge queue. And I'm going to put this under here so we know that that's just a single node. Okay, so we've removed two nodes from the queue. We removed F and R. We added one node to a queue. So we're, we've shrunk our set of nodes by one, we go around again. Is there at least one, is, is there more than one node in these two queues? Yes, absolutely, right? So we go, so we go around again. We're going to look again at the front of the two queues. So we're going to make some internal node, right? We're going to look at the front of the two queues and figure out uh, which uh, things are smallest, right? So we look at D, D has frequency two. We look at RF, RF has frequency three. So we're definitely going to take the D. So we're going to have some internal node here whose left child is D. Okay. And let's remove our D. Okay. Then we look again. We say, okay, what's smaller? Uh, RF has frequency 3. M has frequency 2. So M wins. We remove M. And we set our right child to be M. Our frequency is 4 because 2 plus 2 is 4. So we've made an internal node. We set the left child to be the smallest thing, the right child to be the second smallest thing. Then we need to place this node on the queue. So I'm going to call it DM and put DM on our queue. OK. We've removed two nodes. We've added one node. So we've gone down a node, and we go around again. Are there at least two nodes? Yep. So we keep going. Um, what do we look at now? Uh, so we see that uh, the front of the single queue is space, which has frequency 3. The front of the merge queue is RF, which has frequency 3. We have to tie break. I'm just going to tie break by taking the single queue. It doesn't really matter. Whoops. So I'm just going to take the space, right? doesn't really matter which one I do. I'm just going to pick space arbitrarily and say that, OK, I'm going to make a new internal node. Its left child will be space, OK? I do this again. I look at the single queue and the merge queue. RF has frequency 3. O has frequency 3. Doesn't matter, matter how I tie break. I'm going to pick O arbitrarily so that the right child of this new node that I'm building will be set to O. The frequency of this node will be 6, right? Because 3 and 3, 6. OK? Then we put space O. S space O. It sounds like a astronaut nickname. We put space O on the merge queue. Um, so we've removed two nodes, we've added one node, we're going down still, look, we're, we're, we've only got four nodes left to, to consider, um, and we go around again. So we go around again, we want to find the smallest things, uh, so we, we look uh, at the fronts of the queues, we see RF has frequency 3, E has frequency 4, so RF is smaller, so RF will be the left node of a new internal node we're building. So I'm going to build an internal node. Its left will be R RF. I'm going to look again. What's the smallest thing? 
DM has frequency 4, E has frequency 4, I'm going to arbitrarily pick DM because it doesn't matter and it's easier to draw. I'm going to pick DM as my right child, meaning that this node has frequency 7 and its name doesn't really matter. I'll call it RFDM and I'll put RFDM into the merge queue. It's an R. Okay. I've removed two nodes. I've added one. You see that we're down to three now. We go around again. Okay. We go around again. We look. Uh, space O has frequency six. E has frequency four. So E is much smaller. Not much, but it, E is smaller. So E will be the left child of a new internal node. Left is going to point at E. Okay. Then we look, there's nothing left in the single queue, so the smallest thing must be on the merge queue. So we're going to remove, oops, we're going to remove space O from the merge queue, and space O will be the right child of our new internal node, which has frequency 10, because 6 and 4, right? We give this thing a name, let's call it E space O. It's the new and improved electronic space O. E space O will go on the merge queue, and we go around again because there's two nodes remaining. This one is easy, you can eyeball it. The left will end up being RDFM, the right will end up being E space O, and it will have frequency 17. Right, we'd remove the FDM, we remove the E space O right here. This thing, we can give it a name. Uh, I'm going to call it root, and you'll see why in a second, and we're going to put root on the merge queue. Okay. Now we only have one node remaining on, this, on these queues. Okay. We remove it, and we set it to be our root. We're done. Our algorithm has finished building the tree. So this is the end of your build tree algorithm for the Huffman tree. Okay. So what do we have? We have this this particular um, this particular tree. Uh, what does it tell us? That's sort of the more interesting thing, right? This tree tells us the binary code for every character in this file. How? Uh, you can probably guess. I told you that the depth of the node is directly proportional to the length of its binary code. In fact, it's equal to the length of its binary code. You can use the path it takes to get to a node to denote its binary code. For example, let's find the binary code for E. Okay. If we start at the root, and we're going to try and find E. To get to E, we have to go right and then left. Right. So you see, we, we go right from the root, we go left from the 10, we hit E4. Right. Going right denotes a bit of 1. Going left denotes a bit of zero. That holds for every path in this tree. So every time you would attempt to go right, that means that that, that path represents a bit of one. If you attempt to go left, that path represents a bit of zero. So the binary code for E is one, zero. What's the binary code for R? You can probably guess, right? It's left, 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 so therefore it's 0, 0, 0. Right, so if I ever wanted to encode an R, I would write 0, 0, 0 to my file. Right. Uh, what's the binary code for space? The final frontier. Uh, the f binary, binary code for the final frontier would be right, right, left. So 1, 1, 0. Right, so the, the path, the paths in this tree represent the binary codes for the terminals, these leaf nodes, right? And so that, that binary code can tell you what the value is for that, for that uh, particular character. So I'm going to give you a magic message, and you're going to tell me what that magic message is. 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0. 0, 1, 0. What is that message? How would you decode this using this tree? If I gave you this tree and I gave you that message, could you tell me what I said? The answer is yes. And the way you do that is the following. You start at the front of your binary sequence. 
and the root of your tree. You traverse the tree by following the path. This is a, You can think of this as a path. It's a set of instructions. It tells you which direction to go. So you start at the root, you read a zero, meaning you go left. So now we're going to be here. We're going to read a zero, which means we're going to go left again. So now we'll be here. We read a one, meaning we go right. We hit an F. So we know that this binary code, which was 001, represented the letter F. Now what? Now we just start again. We go back to the root. So now we're no longer at F, but we're back at the root. We read a 1, meaning we go right. We read a 0, meaning we go left. We see E. So we know that this 1, 0 represented the letter E. So you know that when you see this other 1, 0, that's also an E. You should be able to verify that for yourself. What is 1, 0, 1? Or sorry, 0, 1, 0. 0, well, we'd start at the root. 0 would go left. 1 would go right. 0 would go left. So this is a D. Feed was my message. Obviously I need food. Okay. So that's that's how this works. That's the idea behind this, right? So you you can if you have this tree, you can determine you can traverse this entire tree and figure out what the binary code for every character is. Therefore, you can compress your file by reading your file character by character and writing out its bit code to another binary file. You can decode a file. If I give you a tree, you can look at that tree. You can look at the binary file, and you can walk the tree based on the directions given to you in the binary file, and you can reconstruct what that message was. That is Hupf encoding in a, nu in a nutshell. Okay, so um, it's... It's a way, the reason why it's cool is because it reduces the amount of bits you need to store things that are frequent um, by trading them off for things that are infrequent. Um, the tree structure tells you the um, code to represent a particular letter, so you can use it for decoding, and after you've built it, you know how you can encode messages by looking at the path to get to a character. Okay, That's the main idea for this. Thank you.